Hello, everyone. Uh, let's get started with uh, this past paper of P1. Uh, let me just get things straightened out. So, yes, it's all good now. So we are starting with November 2021, variant 32. So let's look at the first question. I'm going to start the recording also. So let's start with the first question. November 2021, paper 32, question number one. The question says, find the value of X for which three multiplying with this bracket is equals to seven raised to power of X. Give your answer in the form ln A over ln B where A and B are integers and we need to find them. Now, first of all, this question is about indices and it's about logarithm. It's a combination of both. So what we do is that we will first simplify three, two raised to power of one minus X is seven raised to power of X. The very first rule that we will apply is A raised to power of M minus N, that is A raised to power of M divided by A raised to power of N. So therefore this needs to be simplified. So this is three, this is two raised to power of one over two raised to power of X is equals to seven raised to power of X. Cross multiply three into two is seven raised to power of X into two raised to power of X. What is the next rule that needs to be applied? That is A raised to power of M into B raised to power of M, that is A B raised to power of M. So this is seven, this is two, they have a common power. So we will write seven into two is 14 raised to power of X equals to six. Now, when this is done, what do we do? At this stage, we will take either common log or natural log of both sides. So log to the base 10, that is written as LG, that is common log log to the base E that is written as LN that is natural log. So let's take natural log on both sides because that is the requirement. LN six is equals to LN 14 raised to power of X. This according to rule of log becomes what? Log X power M basis A that becomes M log X base A. So this becomes X LN 14 and we have ln6 over here. Let's make x the subject. Therefore, x equals to ln6 divided by ln14. Is this of the format that is being asked in the question? Yes, it is. So ln a over ln b, and we have over here ln6 over ln14. In other words, 6 is in place of a, and 14 is in place of b. And yes, we have achieved this answer by applying the rules of logs and the rules of indices. So it's a combination of simplification and logarithm. So we have solved this question in three minutes. So that's how the first question is completed. Let me just double check over here. Okay, it's all good. Let's get started with the second question. So this is the second question over here. And let me just sort out the things. Hold for a second. Now it's all good. I'm just checking the voice. It's all good. Okay, let's get started with the second question. Let's start with the recording. November 2021, paper 32, question number two. The question says, solve the inequality 
3x minus a inside a modulus is greater than 2 multiplying with another modulus. What's inside the other modulus? That is x plus 2a, and a is a positive constant. Now, first of all, we have to realize that when there is modulus on both sides of the inequality, the easiest way to solve it is to square both sides. Positive remains positive. Zero remains zero. Negative becomes positive. So we will write 3x minus a, the whole thing square is greater than 2 bracket x plus 2a, the whole thing square. So therefore, this is 9x square minus 6ax plus a square. And greater sign is there. 2 after squaring becomes 4. This is x square plus 4ax plus 4 a square. This is what you get after the squaring part. Now, what we do is that let's open up the bracket with the 4. That is 4x square plus 16ax plus 16a square. And this is 9x square minus 6ax plus a square. Now, let's transfer all the square terms, all the x terms, all the constants to one side, everything on the left hand side. So 9 minus 4, that is 5x squared. And then we have negative 6ax, and this is positive 16ax. It will go to the other side. That is negative 22ax. And then we have this constant a squared, and we have this constant 16a squared. It goes on the other side. That is negative 15a squared, and this is greater than 0. So this is what we get over here. Now, this is from this point onwards, this is about middle term factorization. So let's focus on this. 5 into negative 15, that is 75 with a negative sign. And we need to break this up. So we will write 5x squared minus 25ax plus 3ax minus 15a squared is greater than zero. This is what we get. Now let's take common. So this is five and this is x and this is x minus five a. And this is three a and this is x minus five a. It's always a good idea to double check. 5x into x, 5x squared, 5x into negative 5a, that is negative 25ax, that's perfect. 3a into x, that's 3ax, 3a into negative 5a, that is negative 15a squared. So now what we will do is that we will take this common. So this is x minus 5a, and these two will be 5x plus 3a is greater than zero. So now what we do is that we draw a horizontal line because we have a quadratic inequality. And whenever we have a quadratic inequality, it is necessary that we factorize, we draw a small sketch, and based upon that sketch, we write down the answer. Now we know that A is positive. So x minus 5a equals to 0. Therefore, x is equals to 5a. And over here, x is equals to negative 3a over 5. That's the reason that they have said that a is positive because the sides won't interchange. This is positive. This is a greater value. This is negative. Negative 3 fifth is negative. a is positive. This is a smaller value. And now we are looking for the region that is greater than 0. So we are looking at this region. We are looking at this region. We go to the right of this value. We would be going up the curve. We go to the left. We will be going up the curve. So therefore, the final answer is x is greater than 5a. And then we have x is lesser than negative 3 fifth a. So this is the final answer for this inequality. The modulus inequality question is completed in five minutes. So now we have completed two questions thoroughly. 
we are on the third question. Sometimes in P3, there are three questions or there are uh, 10 questions, 11 questions, very rare scenario that it could have 12 questions. So now we are focusing on this one. Let me just double check one thing. Okay, it's over here. Okay, let's get started with this. So now let's get started. November 2021, paper 32, question number three. Let's read this question. Part A, given that the complex number U equals to A plus IB, W equals to C plus ID, where A, B, C, and D are real, prove that U plus W star, that's the conjugate, is equals to U star plus W star. Something very simple. So first of all, let me write u, u is a plus bi. Let me write u star, which is a minus bi. The sign of the imaginary number changes. w is c plus di. Therefore, w star is c minus di. It doesn't make a difference whether you write bi or ib. You write di or id, it doesn't make a difference. Now, what needs to be done? Let's add up u plus w. So if I add up u plus w, this is a plus c, the real gets added to the real and the imaginary gets added to the imaginary. What about u star plus w star? So u star plus w star, this is a plus c plus, um, I'm taking minus on the inside, which is minus bi and minus di. So let me just write minus b minus d. And this is i, which can again be written as a plus c. And then there is a negative sign and b plus d on the inside and i on the outside. What about the conjugate of this? So u plus w, the whole thing conjugate, a plus c remains as it is and B plus D remains as it is, but this positive sign on the outside becomes a negative. Now, are these two exactly the same? The answer is yes. So basically I have proven that the two complex numbers, this equals to this. So that was a basic question. So now this is done, let's move on. Now the question says, solve the equation z plus two plus i star. Uh, let me just double check. Why is it showing this thing? Just hold for a second. Let me just double check. Okay, uh, first of all, let me look at the screen share. Okay, I think it's all good now. Let's move on. Just get a sip of water. So now let's look at the next question. That is this, solve the equation z plus two plus i star plus two plus i multiplying with z equals to zero. Give your answer in the form x plus i y, where x and y are real. So basically we're looking for z and we can say let z equals to x plus i y. So first of all, let z equals to x plus i y. Let's focus on this part first. That is z plus two plus i, the whole thing star. That is x plus i y plus two plus i. And there is a star on the outside. That means we have to take the conjugate. So this is x plus two. 
and this is y plus one i and let's apply the star so once we apply the star the sign of the imaginary changes so this is x plus two and this is negative y plus one i this is for the first part now let's focus on this this is two plus i multiplying with z so two plus i is multiplying with z two plus i is multiplying with x plus i y that is two into x and two i y plus i x plus i square y we know that i square is negative one so this is negative y so this is two x minus y and this is two y plus x and this the coefficient this is the coefficient of i so this is also done so this is the second part and this is completed now they are saying that these will add up to zero let me first add it up so when i add it up this is the real this is the imaginary this is the real this is the imaginary the real gets added to the real part so if i focus on the real that is x plus 2 plus 2x minus y so this is x plus 2x which is 3x and this is uh, the 2 remains as it is and let me write y also over here let me focus on the imaginary part the imaginary part is minus y minus one. This is the coefficient of i. And then we have two y plus x. Let me simplify it. So this is two y minus y. This is y. This is x. And this is minus one. So this is equation one. Let me call it equation two. Actually, it is expression. This is not an equation yet. This is an expression but it is equaling to zero so now the zero over here what does it mean the zero means zero plus zero i so now it will become an equation this thing should equal to zero the real part is zero this should also equal to zero the imaginary part is zero so therefore three x plus two minus y equals to zero. Therefore, three x plus two equals to y. And similarly, y plus x minus one equals to zero. Therefore, y can be written as one minus x. So now let's equate this with this. So three x plus two equals to one minus x. Three x plus x, this is four x and one minus two is negative one. Therefore, x comes out to be negative one fourth. That's the value of x. And let me evaluate y over here. So y is one minus x, y is one minus minus one fourth, y comes out to be five fourth. So we want the answer in the form z is x plus i y. So this is minus one fourth plus five fourth i. This is the complex number. This is the solution of this equation. So this was a complex number question related to the algebraic part. And we have completed this in seven minutes. So now this question is completed. Three questions are down. And let me just adjust the camera a bit. OK. Now let's look at this question, the partial fraction question. November 2021, paper 32, question four, express 4x squared minus 13x plus 13 divided by 2x minus 1, x minus 3. Now, first of all, whenever we are dealing with a partial fraction question, the very first thing that we need to take care of is whether it's a proper or an improper fraction. So now the highest power is two. So the highest power is two and the highest power in the denominator is also two. So since the power of the numerator and the power of the denominator is the same, it's an improper algebraic fraction. So now since an improper algebraic fraction, what do we do? 
we carry out algebraic division to find the quotient. That's one way of doing it. Another way is I can write this thing as 4x square minus 13x plus 13 divided by 2x minus 1. And this is x minus 3. We know that we will get a constant. So let it be equal to this. This is a plus a constant over the linear factor and then another constant, which is C over the linear factor. Now this can be found out using observation. We know that the coefficient of X square is four. The coefficient of X square in the denominator is two X square. So therefore this will come out to be two. And then we can start taking LC. So there are two approaches. We can choose either one of them. I think I'll go ahead and choose the algebraic division approach. So first of all, let me focus on the denominator, which is 2x minus 1 multiplying with x minus 3. So this is 2x squared negative 6x negative 3 negative x over here. And this is plus 3. So this is 2x squared minus 7x plus 3. This is step number 1. Step number 2 is we will write the numerator on the inside, which is 4x square minus 13x plus 13. And we are dividing it with the denominator, which is 2x square minus 7x plus 3. So now only one step of long division is needed. 4x square divided by 2x square is 2. Let's multiply it out. That is 4x square minus 14x plus 6. Now let's change the sign and add. So this is negative. This is positive. This is negative. So negative 13 plus 14, that comes out to be X and 13 minus six, that is plus seven. So therefore step three is we have the quotient, which is two. We have the remainder, which is X plus seven. And what else do we have? We have the divisor, which was already given, which was in fact, these two factors multiplying together, 2x minus 1, x minus 3. So this is 2x minus 1, and this is x minus 3. So quotient plus remainder over divisor, this is 2 plus x plus 7 divided by 2x minus 1, and this is x minus 3. Now the focus is on this part. This needs to be broken up into its partial fraction. And that brings us to step number four. So step number four is we have X plus seven divided by two X minus one. And this is X minus three. It's identical to a constant over the first factor, another constant C over the other factor. Now let's take LCM. So this is 2x minus 1, and it's multiplying with x minus 3. And we have b multiplying with x minus 3, and we have c multiplying with 2x minus 1. And this is the numerator over here. Since the two fractions are identical, therefore, the numerator equals the numerator. So therefore, x plus 7 is equal to identical to b times x minus 3 and c times 2x minus 1. Now let me choose a value which will eliminate one constant. Let me start with 3. So let x is equals to 3. So therefore 3 plus 7 equals to b multiplying with 0 and c is multiplying with 2 into 3, 6, 6 minus 1 is 5. So this is 5c. This is 10. This is 5c. Therefore c comes out to be 2. Now let me rewrite it. X plus seven is equal to B times X minus three and C is two multiplying with two X minus one. Let me choose another value. I could have chosen half or even better. Let me choose zero. If I choose zero, what do I have? Seven equals to B into negative three and two multiplying with negative one. 7 
equals to minus 3b and this is minus 2. Let's take 2 to the other side. So therefore, 9 is equals to negative 3b. Therefore, b comes out to be negative 3. So now we have found the value of b, which is negative 3, and c is positive 2 over here. And don't forget this 2 over here. So therefore, the very, very final answer is 2 plus negative 3 over the first linear factor and 2 over the second linear factor. What were the linear factors? Uh, the first one is 2x minus 1, and the other one is x minus 3. So this is 2x minus 1, and this is x minus 3. So therefore, this is the final answer for this partial fraction question. We have completed this in a little less than seven minutes. So now four questions are completed. Let's move to the fifth one. Let me just get this thing a little bit straight. I'm just holding out, hold for a second. Okay, let's get started with this for a second. Why is the screen? Okay, that's perfect. Mute, that's done. And let's get started. <clears throat> November 2021, variant 32. Question five. The question says, on a sketch of an argand diagram, shape the region whose points represent the complex number Z, satisfying the inequalities this and this. Now, first of all, let me draw a grid. So let me draw a grid somewhere over here. And we know that the x-axis is called the real axis and the y-axis is called the imaginary axis. And let me focus on the first inequality, z minus three plus two i inside the modulus is less than or equal to one. Now the inequality is related with shading, but what is the locus itself? The locus is, it's a circle, and the center of the circle is 3, 2. And the radius is 1 unit. So this is the center and this is the radius. Is x, the imaginary part of z, is y. So when we say imaginary part of z is greater than or equal to 2, it means y is greater than or equal to 2. So let me label some points. So therefore, this is origin, this is 1, and this is 2, and this is 3, and this is 1, and this is 2. Actually, this is 1i and 2i, and let me also label 3i over here. Now let me draw a circle. So let me grab a circle and the circle should be a small one 
So let me draw it in orange. And the circle is something like this. So let me just move it around, but uh, okay. So the circle is something like this approximately, but I cannot resize it. So let me draw a bigger circle this time. So let me draw something like this. Okay. Now the center of the circle is three comma two. So let me just grab it. And this is three and two, something like this. Okay, now this part is done. And then what is the next thing that I need to draw? That is the line y is greater than or equal to two. So this is y is equals to two. And I need to shade the common region. So this is greater. That means it's above this line. And it should be inside the circle. So therefore, the final answer is this thing. That is the shaded region. So that is for the first part. Now, what is the second part? It says, find the greatest value of arguments of Z for points in the shaded region. Give your answer in degrees. Now, first of all, when we talk about argument of Z, we are dealing with a loci, which is called a half line. An argument of Z means argument of Z minus zero plus zero I. This half line, the starting point is the origin. The starting point is zero, zero. Now let me go up and let me draw a half line over here. The half line will be starting from here and value when it will be touching this over here. So let me just increase the line, the length of the line like this. And this is what I'm looking for. So basically, I'm looking for this particular angle over here. Now let me draw a few other lines that will help me in evaluating this. Let me draw a line like this. And let me label some points. So this is the origin. Let me label this point as A. Let me label the center as C. And what else is there? So now this is 3, 2. So let me draw a line from here till here. So now this is like this, and this goes like this. And let me label this point as D. Now there are two angles that you can see. This angle over here, the small one, and this angle over here. Now, first of all, let me just show you the angle in close detail. This is the angle that we are looking for, as well as this angle, and this will be the argument of Z. So let me label this angle as phi. Let me label this angle over here as theta. And basically, I'll be looking for phi plus theta. Now I have O, I have A, I have C. I have the distance OC, which can be found using Pythagoras theorem. And I have this distance, which is the radius, which is one unit. I can find this angle. So this is opposite. And this is the uh, hypotenuse because this is the 90 degree angle. And phi can be found out, this is three and this is two units. So it's pretty basic stuff. So let me just reduce it and let me work it out. So now uh, let me do the working. There is OAC and OCD. So these are the two things that we need to draw. So first of all, let me draw, this goes like this. And we have a line going this way. So let me just draw it in other detail like this and then like this and something like this. So this is one triangle. So this is O and this is C and this is A. This is 90 degree, but I have drawn it the other way around. So just hold for a second. So let me just go back. There is OAC 
and OCD. So these are the two things that we need to draw. So okay, let me just continue from here. <clears throat> and let me just double check one thing. So it goes 90 degrees at the top. Okay, I'm starting again. So now let me draw a right angle triangle. First of all, it's going this way and then this way like this and then this way. Now this is O, this is A, this is 90 degree, this is the center which is C. Now remember O is 0 comma 0, center is 3 comma 2, Therefore, the magnitude of OC is 3 square plus 2 square square root, which comes out to be root 13. 13. And how much is AC? That is the radius, one unit. And this angle over here is theta. So therefore, sine of theta, let me evaluate this. Sine of theta equals to one over square root of 13. Therefore, theta is sine inverse of one over root 13. So this is sine inverse of one over root 13, which comes out to be 0 0.2810 radians. Now let's look at the other triangle. The other triangle is ODC. That is pretty basic. So ODC goes like this. So let me draw this ODC. So this is like this, and then it's something like this. And this is the third line. And let me mark this as 90. This is three, this is two, this is five, and let's use tangent. So tangent of five is two over three. And therefore, uh, let me just double check. This is three and two, it's perfect. So therefore, phi equals to tangent inverse of two over three, which comes out to be 0 0.5880, this is phi. Therefore, the maximum value of argument of Z is theta plus phi. Take this value, take this value, add it up. This comes out to be 0.869 radians. And if you wanted the answer in uh, degrees, that's also acceptable. So argument of Z equals to 49.8 degrees. But since we are dealing with complex number, it's better to give the answer in radians. So we have completed this question that involved a lot of uh, geometry, circle property, triangle property from O-level maths in nine minutes. So now question number five, is completed. Move on. And let me just turn on the AC faster. Okay. So let's get started with this one. I'm just, the date is a bit slow. So I'm just turning it off. November 2021, paper 32, question six. The question says, using the expansion of sine three X plus two X and sine three X minus two X show that half sine of five X plus sine of X equals to this. Now three X plus two X is five X. Three X minus two X is sine X. So let's keep that in mind. First of all, sine, 5x is written as sine bracket 3x plus 2x. Using the addition formula, we have sine 3x and cosine 2x plus cosine 3x sine of 2x. That is the first expansion. Similarly, sine of x is written as sine of 3x minus 2x. That is sine 3x cosine 2x minus cosine 3x sine 2x. Now I have to take this and this, and I'm adding it up and then dividing by two. 
So if I add it up, these two terms get canceled out and I have sine three X cosine two X and there are two terms with it. But since this the side, this two and this two cancels out and we get this part. So that was pretty basic. Let me recap it. Sine three plus two X, sine three X minus two X is sine X. This is the expansion. Add and then half it. So add, when we add these two terms get canceled out. There are two terms of this. Half of that, we are simply left with this. So this is for three marks. Now we know that if we were to integrate sine 3x cosine 2x dx, that is the same thing as integrating half bracket sine 5x plus sine x. That is what we are integrating. Let's double check. So therefore, this is sine 3x cosine 2x is half sine 5x plus sine x. So it's simple, basic integration. Also remember that integral of cosine x is sine x. But integral of sine x is negative cosine x. And also we should remember that if there is a coefficient of x, the rule is that of division when we are dealing with integration. So now let's integrate. So this is half. Integral of sine 5x is cosine 5x divided by 5 with a negative sign. Integral of sine x is negative cosine x. And yes, there are limits, which is zero and pi by four. This is zero and this is pi by four. Now, first of all, let me take this negative sign common out and I'm left with negative half. And this is one fifth cosine five X. And this is plus cosine X and the limits are zero and pi by four. I can get rid of this negative sign if I change the places of these limits. So therefore this is half and this is one fifth cosine of five X plus cosine of X and zero becomes the upper limit, pi by four becomes the lower limit. Now let's do some trigonometric calculation on the side. Cosine of zero comes out to be one. Cosine of pi by four is root two over two. Five times pi by four is in the third quadrant. The basic angle is still pi by four, but in the third quadrant, cosine is negative. Of course, we can get it from the calculator. Cosine of five pi by four is negative root two over two. Now, when you have everything ready, now plug in the limits. So let's plug in the upper limit first. So this is half and this is one fifth and this is cosine of zero plus cosine of zero. Five times zero is still zero. And then let me put a big bracket over here, minus, let me plug in pi by four. So this is one fifth and five times pi by four is five pi by four. And this is cosine of pi by four. And let's close the bracket. So let's double check everything. There is no hurry. This is zero, five times zero is zero. Here is zero. Sine value over here. And cosine of pi by four is cosine of pi by four. Now let me write down the values. Cosine of zero is one. Cosine of zero is one. Cosine of five pi by four is negative root two over two. Cosine of pi by four is positive root two over two. Now let's simplify. There is a half on the outside and inside the first bracket, this is one fifth into one plus one. So this is one fifth plus one, which is six fifth. And minus again, there is a one fifth multiplying with this, 
which is negative root 2 over 2, and this is positive root 2 over 2. And let's close the bracket. So now, first of all, let me simplify this. So if I simplify this, what is it? This is negative root 2 over 2. This is positive root 2 over 2. And this 1 fifth is multiplying with it. So this is basically like x minus 1 fifth x. This is x. This is 1 fifth x. This is 4 fifth x. So therefore, this is after the negative sign. This is 4 fifth of root 2 over 2. And 1 fifth plus 1 is 6 fifth. And yes, there is a half on the outside. Now let's look at the answer. One fifth is there, and this is three minus root two. So now let me just take this five common out first. So therefore, this one fifth is taken common out. And then on the inside, this half is there. Half is multiplying with six, that is three. Half gets multiplied with this four, and this two. So therefore, this is two and two, and we are left with root two, double check. Let me go up again. And I think that is the exact answer that is given over here. One fifth, three minus root two. So it's all done and dusted. And the time taken is approximately eight minutes. So now six questions are completed. Let's look at the seventh question. So now it took us approximately how many minutes? 45 minutes to do six questions. Pretty good. Let's move on. Let me just get a sip of water. Okay, so let's get started. Second, let me just get the AC correct. Okay, so let's get started. <clears throat> November 2021, paper 32, question seven. The question says, the variables X and Y satisfy the differential equation. This is it over here. And it is given that Y is one when X is zero. So this is the condition that we will use and this is the differential equation over here. Solve the differential equation, obtaining an expression for y in terms of x. Now the very first rule of differential equation is separate the variables. Before that, you cannot decide on the technique of integration. So that's the very first thing. So we have dy on the left-hand side, and one over y squared goes on the left. Actually, y squared goes on the left. It becomes one over y squared. And then what do we have on the right? We have 4x. We have e raised to power of negative 2x. Because this e raised to power of 2x goes down, I need a product for integration by parts. So I have taken it up. And this is dx over here. So we have to integrate, integrate both sides. Now, first of all, let me do integration by parts. So this is 4x e negative 2x dx. u is taken as 4x. dv is taken as e raised to power of negative 2x dx. Therefore, du is 4dx. And v is negative half e raised to power of negative 2x. Let's follow the arrows. So what do we get? We get 4x multiplying with this, which is negative 2x e raised to power of negative 2x. 
and this four multiplies with this. So that is again a negative, but don't forget there is a negative integral sign for integration by parts. It's u v minus integral v du. So this negative, this negative cancels. We are left with a 2e minus 2x. So this is plus 2e negative 2x. And yes, there is a dx. So let me first write it down. So this becomes negative 2x e negative 2x plus 2e minus 2x. 2e minus 2x dx with an integral sign. Let me proceed further. Negative 2x e raised to power of negative 2x division by minus 2. So this 2 will cancel. Negative e raised to power of negative 2x plus c. And what about 1 over y squared? That is y raised to power of negative 2 plus 1 over negative 2 plus 1 that is negative one over y. So now let's check everything. We have done variable separable. This results in integration by parts that is done over here. This is u, this is du, this is dv, this is v, this is u multiplying with this uv, which simplifies to this minus integral v du. So this minus minus becomes cancelled. The integration sign is there. After integration, e raised to power of minus 2x is giving us a negative half. So that negative half cancels with the two. This negative remains and this is plus c. Now let's proceed. Uh, let me multiply with a negative sign. So therefore, this is 1 over y. This is plus 2x e raised to power of negative 2x plus e raised to power of negative 2x. And instead of plus c, which becomes minus c, let me write a plus d over here. Now let's focus on the limits. Actually, these are the conditions. When x is 0, y is 1 when x is 0. So now let me plug in y is 1 when x is 0. So 1 over 1, 2 into 0 into e raised to power of 0 plus e raised to power of 0 plus t. This becomes 0, but this becomes 1. There is a 1 over here. Therefore, d comes out to be 0. Therefore, this is 1 over y is equals to 2x e raised to power of negative 2x plus e raised to power of negative 2x and d is 0. Now, depends on which format do we need it. We need to make y the subject. Now, first of all, let me take e raised to power of negative 2x common out. And this is 2x plus 1. Can I write this thing as 1 over e raised to power of negative 2x. So this is 2x plus 1 over e raised to power of 2x is 1 over y. Now this makes more sense. 1 over y equals to this. Therefore, y over 1 equals to e raised to power of 2x over 2x plus 1. And this is what was required. Make y the subject. Not only have we solved this differential equation, we have found the general solution, the particular solution by separating the variable, by carrying out integration by parts. And then we have found an expression for y in terms of x in six minutes. So this question is completed. Seven questions are done. Let's move to the eighth question. It's right over here. OK, so let's get started. Let me just double check one thing. This is showing me another class. Okay. Now, November 2021, paper 32, question 8. Let's look at this question. By first expanding cos square theta plus sine square theta whole square, show that this equals to this. Now, first of all, we know that 
cos square theta plus sine square theta equals to one. We have this knowledge. Let's keep it on the side. Then I see a sine two theta over here. So let me write sine two theta is two sine theta cosine theta. Sometimes we play around with this two. And what else is there? We know this identity that a plus b whole square, that is a square plus two a b plus b square. And uh, I think that's about it. So let's get started. So we have cosine square theta plus sine square theta, the whole thing square. That is cosine four theta plus two sine square theta, cosine square theta, and this is sine power four theta. Now let's focus on the spot. We know indices that a power m, b power m, that is a b power m. That means sine square, cosine square can be written as sine cosine the whole thing square. So this is two and this is sine theta cosine theta, the whole thing square. I'm just focusing on this part first. Now, isn't this equals to sine two theta divided by two? So let me write this. So this is half sine two theta, and there is a square outside. Let me simplify this further. So this is two, this is one fourth, this is sine square two theta. Now that makes sense. Now, what else do we have? This cosine power four theta is there all the time. And there is a plus sign, there is a plus sign, there is a plus sign. And then naturally we also have sine power four theta, sine power four theta. This is sine power four theta. And isn't this equals to one? So let it equal to one. And all the way this equals to one. So now we need to make these two the subject. So therefore our focus is on this and this transfer everything to the other side. So cos power four theta plus sine power four theta equals to one minus this two and one fourth becomes half. This is half sine square two theta. So this is the identity that we have proven thoroughly. And what is the next part? Now it says solve this equation equals to five over nine. We just have proven that this equals to one minus half sine square two theta and let it equal to five over nine. There is no harm in double checking it. So this is one minus half sine square two theta because this is sine two theta whole square. This becomes one fourth, this becomes sine square two theta. This is all good, all perfect. Now, minus half sine square two theta equals to five over nine minus one. Minus half sine square two theta equals to negative four over nine. These two negative sign will cancel, take two to the other side. So therefore this is sine square two theta equals to eight over nine. Therefore, sine two theta equals to plus minus eight over nine, the whole thing square root, which becomes square root eight plus minus divided by three, which in decimals is plus minus 0.9428. This equals to sine two theta. I'll just take a break for Azan and I'll be back in five minutes once uh, with the namas.
Okay, so let's continue with this. I'll just double check the recording. It's equals to sine two theta. <clears throat> so everything is set, we can get started. So now what do we have to do? We have to go to the basics of solving a trigonometric equation. Now, first of all, whenever we have to solve a trigonometric equation, there is some range of values of theta given, which is between zero and 180. So step number one is that theta lies between zero and 180 degrees, but we are dealing with two theta. So two theta lies between zero and 360 degrees. Step number two can be about the quadrants. The steps could be interchange, that's not an issue. Step two is about quadrants. Since because we are taking the square root, there is a positive and a negative sign. Therefore, the answer is in all four quadrants. In the first quadrant, theta is equals to alpha. In the second quadrant, theta is 180 degrees minus alpha. In the third quadrant, theta is 180 degrees plus alpha. In the fourth quadrant, theta is 360 degrees minus alpha. What is alpha? Alpha is the basic angle. That brings us to the third part, the third step. Let alpha be the basic angle. That is the acute angle with the x-axis. So therefore, sine of alpha equals to positive. We always calculate with the positive trigonometric ratio, 0.9428. And this alpha is coming out to be 70.53 degrees. We are working in two decimal places. So that the final answer is given to one decimal place. So therefore, two theta, this brings us to the fourth step. Two theta equals to first quadrant, theta is alpha, that is 70.53 degrees. Second quadrant, that is 180 minus 70.53 degrees. Third quadrant, it's 180 plus 70.53 degrees. Fourth quadrant, that is 360 minus 70.53 degrees but all these values are equaling to two theta. Therefore make theta the subject, divide by two each answer. And therefore the very final answer is coming out to be 35.3 and then 54.7 and then 125.3 and then 144.7. All these answers are given correct to one decimal place. So now this question is completed in a little bit more than seven minutes. So now this is done and we are moving to the eighth question. So let's get started with this. November, 2021, paper 32, question nine. Let's read this question. The equation of a curve is y e raised to power of 2x minus y square e raised to power of x equals to 2. Show that dy by dx equals to this fraction. So now we should remember what is product rule of differentiation. y is u v. Therefore, dy by dx is u v prime plus v u prime. We'll be using this. Now, first of all, let's write down, differentiate both sides with respect to x. So that is the first thing that we do in implicit differentiation. So we have y e to x minus y square e x equals to two. And differentiate both sides differentiate both sides with respect to x. If I focus on this one, I have to apply the product rule. 
So this is y multiplying with derivative of e2x, which is 2e2x. And then e2x multiplying with derivative of y, which is 1 dy by dx. And now there is a negative sign over here. And then let's focus on this. This is y square multiplying with derivative of ex, which is ex. And ex multiplying with derivative of y square, which is 2y dy by dx. And then at the very end, derivative of this constant is 0. Now let me put a bracket over here. Let me put a bracket over here, and this is 0. Now remember, the rule of implicit differentiation is if it's a term involving x and there is x over here, everything is perfect just like before. Whenever there is y, don't forget to multiply by dy by dx. Now let's open up the bracket. So this is 2y e2x and this is e2x dy by dx. This is negative y squared e raised to power of x. This is 2y e x dy by dx and this equals to zero. Now this term has dy by dx in it. This term has dy by dx in it. Let's transfer it to the left. They are already on the left hand side. That means transfer these two terms to the right hand side. So first of all, let me write the right hand side, which is y square e raised to power of x. And this is negative 2y e raised to power of 2x. And what's on the left hand side? We have dy by dx common. And I have e raised to power of 2x minus 2y e x. Let me double check. e raised to power of 2x dy by dx. And this is 2y e x dy by dx. dy by dx is taken common out y square e x is transferred to the other side, 2y e 2 x is transferred to the other side, the signs are all perfect. Now we need this thing in this form and we don't see e to the power 2 x over here, that means it has been cancelled out. So first of all, even before I move on, let me write dy by dx, let me take e raised to power of x common, Therefore, inside I'm left with e raised to power of x minus 2y. And what else is there? We have again e raised to power of x common. This is y square and this is minus 2y e raised to power of x. And I think that's about it. Now let's slash off these two. And therefore dy by dx is equaling y square minus 2y e raised to power of x and this is e x minus 2y. Now I need to double check. So y square minus, it's written the opposite way, minus y square plus 2y e x and minus e x plus 2y. So let me just change all the signs. So basically I'm taking a negative common out at the top, which is 2y e x minus y square. I'm taking a negative common in the downstairs, which is the denominator, which is 2y minus ex. And let me double check once again. So this is 2y ex minus y square. This is 2y minus ex. So 2y ex minus y square, 2y minus ex. So therefore this is all good. And this negative cancel out, and this equals to dy by dx. So the first part is proven. Let's move to the next part. Find the exact coordinates of the point on the curve where the tangent is parallel to y-axis. dy by dx is gradient of tangent. The tangent could be parallel to x-axis. That means the gradient is zero. The tangent could be parallel to y-axis. That means the gradient is undefined. Now, if the dy by dx is in a fraction form, numerator over denominator, if it's undefined, what makes a fraction undefined when denominator equals to zero? So what is the denominator over here? 2y minus e power x. So let me write it. 
Therefore, 2y minus e power x equals to 0. 2y is equals to e power x. y is equals to half e power x. Let's solve it simultaneously with equation of curve. So let me write down the equation of curve. What's the equation of the curve? It's right over here. y squared e raised to power of 2x minus y squared e x. y squared e raised to power of 2x minus, I think it's y e x equals to 2. So if I use it, let me double check once more. This is y e x, actually y e 2x and y square e x y e 2x and y square e x. So therefore this is y e 2x and this is y square e x. Now it's all good. So now let me plug in this value of y. So half e x multiplying with this e x and then we have minus y square which is half e x whole square into this e x and this is equaling to this two over here. Now let's simplify. This is e x and this I think is e two x. Let me go back and double check. Hold for a second, I think, yes. So now let me go back and just do a bit of correction. Just let me go back like this all but simultaneously. And let me just delete it from here. Hold for a second. So let me write down the equation of curve. Okay, so let me just grab my pencil and let me write down the equation of curve. So equation of curve is y square y e two x minus y square e x is equals to two. So now I'll start the correction from here. Y e two x. Okay, I'm starting the recording. So the equation of the curve is y e raised to power of 2x. And then a negative sign, y square e raised to power of x equals to 2. Wherever there is y, wherever there is y, we have to plug this in. Let me just do one more calculation. y square is half e x the whole thing square which is one fourth e raised to power of 2x. So therefore this will go over here and this y will go over here. So let me write it down. This is half e x and it's multiplying with e raised to power of 2x. And then we have y square which is one fourth e raised to power of 2x it's multiplying with e raised to power of x equals to two. Don't forget the negative sign over here. Now it's fit to be calculated. So e power x, e power two x, that's a half e raised to power of three x minus one fourth, again, e raised to power of three x is equaling two. e raised to power of three x common out. This is half minus one fourth equals to two. That is e raised to power of 3x, 1 fourth equals to 2. e raised to power of 3x equals to 1 fourth multiplying with 2, which is 8. And now what do we do? We take ln of both sides. When we take ln of both sides, 3x ln e is ln 8. We know that ln of e is 1. Therefore, x is one third ln of a, but it's not over yet. This is ln a raised to power of one third, which is ln of two. So that is the x coordinate. And what is the y coordinate? That's half e raised to power of x. So therefore, the y coordinate is half e raised to power of x, which is half e raised to power of ln two, the rule is e raised to power of ln x equals to x provided x is greater than zero. So therefore e raised to power of ln two is two. This is half into two, which comes out to be one. So this is the x coordinate. This is the y coordinate. Therefore the final answer, the coordinate is 
ln2 comma 1 that is what we were looking for so now this question is done in nine minutes so question number nine is completed let's move to question number 10 let me just uh, send a voice message hold for a second Okay, so let's get started now. November 2021, paper 32, question number 10. Uh, something with the stuck, hold for a second. Let me get started once again. Mm. Seconds, let's share over here. Okay, so now we are starting once again. November 2021, paper 32, question number 10. This is about vectors with respect to origin O, the position vectors of the point A and B are given as follows. Find a vector equation of the line through A and B. Now, if this is the line, and these are two points. Let me label one of them as A and the other one as B. Let me find AB for the direction vector, which is OB minus OA, which is 0, 3, 1, minus 1, 2, negative 1. So this is negative 1, this is 1, and this is 2. This is the direction vector. So either I can take AB as the direction vector or I can also take BA as the direction vector. What about the fixed point? Either I can take OB or I can take OA. So let me write this thing as R is equals to OB, which is 0, 3, 1 plus lambda, the parameter multiplying with minus 1, 1 and 2. This is the vector equation of the line. Now, for further purposes, let me also write that if a point P is on this line, then the position vector of OP can be written as zero plus lambda into minus one, that is minus lambda. And this is three plus lambda and one plus two lambda. So I've just written it like this. Now let's focus on this. The point C lies on L and is such that AC is three AB find the position vector of C. Now, AC is OC minus OA and three times AB. And we just found what is AB, which is right over here, which is minus one, one and two. So therefore, this is three times minus one, one and two, which comes out to be minus three, three and six. And OC is made the subject and do we have OA? Yes, we have OA. OA is right over here, which is one, two, negative one. So this is OA is one, two, negative one. So transfer it to the other side, that becomes plus one, two, negative one. Therefore, OC is coming out to be minus two and five and five. This is OC. So that is also something very basic. Now it says, find the possible position vectors of point P on L such that the magnitude of OP is root 14. 
So this is magnitude. Now we have just written that OP is negative lambda and three plus lambda and one plus two lambda. So therefore magnitude of OP would be negative lambda square and three plus lambda square and one plus two lambda whole square square root. So let me simplify it. This is lambda square. This is nine plus six lambda plus lambda square. This is one plus four lambda plus four lambda square. And don't forget the square root. So therefore, this is lambda square, this is lambda square, and this is four lambda square, which is six lambda square. And then we have six lambda and four lambda, which is 10 lambda. And then we have a constant nine and we have a constant one that adds up to 10. And yes, there is a square root. But isn't this equals to root 14? But magnitude of OP is equals to square root of 14. So now I can take this and equate with this. The square root will disappear. So therefore, 6 lambda squared plus 10 lambda plus 10 equals to 14. Let's divide by 2. 3 lambda squared plus 5 lambda plus 5 equals to 7. 3 lambda squared plus 5 lambda minus 2 equals to 0. So let's factorize. So therefore, 3 lambda squared negative lambda plus 6 lambda minus 2 equals to 0. No harm in double check. 3 into negative 2 is negative 6. Plus 6 into negative 1 is also negative 6. It's adding up to this. So therefore, lambda common. And this is a 3 lambda minus 1. And this is 2 common. And this is 3 lambda minus 1 equals to 0. Therefore, 3 lambda minus 1. And this is lambda plus 2 equals to 0. Therefore, equating each bracket to 0, lambda is positive 1 third, lambda is positive 2, actually negative 2. So let me correct it. So now, if these are the values of lambda, what are we looking for? We are looking for the possible position vectors of P. P was on line L. And I have to plug in lambda where it belongs. So OP, let me write it again. So OP is negative lambda. And then I have 3 plus lambda and 1 plus 2 lambda. So if I use this first value, lambda is 1 third. Therefore, OP is coming out to be negative 1 third, 3 plus 1 third. And this is 1 plus 2 times 1 third, which simplifies to negative 1 third. And this is 10 over 3. And this is 5 over 3. This is one of the possible position vector of P. What about the other value? The other value is lambda equals to minus 2. So let me plug it in. Lambda equals to negative 2. Therefore, OP is negative of negative 2. And this is 3 plus negative 2 and 1 plus 2 times negative 2. So therefore, this comes out to be 2. And this is 3 minus 2 is 1. And minus 4 plus 1 is negative 3. So this is the other possible position vector of P. And that completes this vector question. And it took us seven minutes to complete it. So 10 questions are down. We are going to the last question. That's 11. Okay. <clears throat> Hold for a second. Okay, we are starting now. November 2021, paper 32, question 11. The equation of a curve as y is equals to square root of tangent x, x lies between 0 and pi by 2. First part, 
we have to find the gradient function dy by dx in terms of tangent x and verify that dy by dx is one when x is pi by four. First of all, we will write y is equals to tangent of x raised to power of half. Therefore, dy by dx, according to chain rule, half comes down, tangent x remains as it is, power reduces by one, don't forget to multiply by derivative of bracket, which is sig square x. So derivative of tangent is six square. So let me simplify. This is half. This is one over square root of tangent x. And this is six square x. But we want dy by dx in terms of tangent x. So we know that one plus tan square x is six square x. Therefore, what is tan square x? Six square x minus one. What is six square x? One plus tan square x. So this is half. And this is one plus tan square x over square root of tangent x. So this part is done. What about the verification part? When x is pi by four, we know that tangent of pi by four comes out to be one. So therefore dy by dx, it's half over here. And then this is one plus one square divided by square root of one. So this is two over one is two, half of two is one. So therefore this is verified. The answer was already given. We just have to verify it. Let's move to the next part. The value of dy by dx is also one at another point on the curve where x is equals to a. Now this is a, and let's say, if I draw a tangent like this, this value of the gradient is one. It was already one at this point also. Now you can see that these two lines are exactly parallel. Now uh, we are interested in showing that this cubic equation equals to zero where t is tangent of a. Now, first of all, how do we get started with this? We will say that let's take dy by dx and let's equate it to one. What is dy by dx? This is one plus tan square something divided by square root of tangent of something equals to one. And we are talking about at point where x is equals to a. So instead of x right a, instead of x right a, and instead of tangent x, we are writing tangent a, and in short form, we will write it as t. So therefore, 1 plus t square is equals to 1 multiplying with square root of t. This 1 is over here, and it's multiplying with tangent of a like this. Now, what do we do? we square both sides. So when we square both sides, the square root will disappear on the right hand side. So on the left hand side, this is one plus t square square, and this is root t square. So this is one plus two t square plus t power four equals two t. And if I transfer everything to the left, this is a t4 plus 2t square, and then there is no cubic term, and then there is a negative t plus one equals to zero. This is what I have. Now the problem is, this is a quartic equation, a power four equation. How do I get to a power three, a cubic equation? Again, the rule is this dy by dx is also zero. It's also one at another point on the curve where x is equals to a. That means I know that dy by dx is equals to gradient of tangent. We know that dy by dx can be written as tangent of theta or for this matter tangent of a and this tangent of a equals to one. Therefore, if I write tangent of a equals to one, therefore tangent a minus one equals to zero, this becomes a linear factor. 
Now, if I take this linear factor and I carry out long division, algebraic division, I'll get that cubic equation. So let's get started. So we have t minus one over here. That is this tangent A is written as t. And we have the quartic equation, which is t power four plus zero t cube, because the cubic term was missing, minus actually plus two t square minus t plus one. And we need to carry out long division. So let's take the highest power, which is t4, and divide by t power 1, which is t cube. So therefore, t cube into t, that's t power 4, and this is negative t cube. Change the signs and add. So therefore, this is t cube over here. Pull one term down. This is 2t squared. Repeat the same process. t cube over t that is t squared. So this is t cube minus t square. Again, change the sign and add. So therefore, 2t squared plus t squared, which is 3t squared, pull this down, negative t. Repeat the same process, 3t squared over t, that is 3t. And this is 3t squared, minus 3t. Again, change the sign and add negative t plus 3t, which is 2t. And uh, we have one over here. But let me just double check. Maybe there is a sign mistake that I have done. Let me pause for a second. OK. Uh, let me first have a good look at it. So this is power 4. And this is t cube. This is plus. This is 2t square. So therefore, t4, 2t square, and 4t. I think I have copied something wrong. So this is t4 plus 2t square minus 4t. Uh -huh. I have to go all the way, way back. OK, so there is time for another class. Uh, let me just solve it a little bit later on. And so that I can just start that class on time. So people who are over here, let me uh, get this thing corrected. And then I'll upload it so you can see the lecture over there. Because a lot of uh, working needs to be done. I made some initial error early on. So till then, take care.